Hello everyone. Welcome to Yesteryear Videos. My video today is about an awesome first lady. Her name was Jackie Kennedy. She was the very essence of style and grace. Mrs. Kennedy once told a story about her husband, JFK, that he liked to listen to songs from the popular stage play, Camelot. One of those songs has the phrase, Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. This statement from Jackie about the Camelot became the ultimate description of the Kennedy presidency. Now let's look at these photos and listen to uh, this JFK uh, favorite song, uh, Camelot, and a few short videos to sort of give us a taste and a, uh, a feel for that one brief shining moment known as Camelot. Each evening from December to December before you drift to sleep upon your cot think back on all the tales that you remember of Camelot ask every person if he's heard the story and tell it strong and clear if he has not that once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot. 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 Now say it out with love and joy. Camelot. Camelot. Yes, Camelot, my boy. Where once it never rained till after sundown By 8 a.m. the morning fog had flown Don't let it be forgot That once there was a spot For one brief shining moment That was known as Camelot. Kennedy arrives at the shipyard in Groton, Connecticut to christen the newest nuclear submarine to join the U.S. Navy. The sub is to be named for the Maquis de Lafayette, the first ballistic missile underseas craft that has not been named for an American-born patriot. The 7,000-ton vessel is the heaviest of its type ever built and will be armed with Polaris missiles which have a range of 2,500 miles. Using both English and French, the First Lady christens the sub for the French patriot who lent such great aid to the American Revolution. The Navy now has 24 nuclear submarines in commission, and eight of these are ballistic missile craft like the Lafayette. It will be manned by two crews, so that it will be on continuous sea duty. While one takes it to sea, the other will rest and train ashore. So it's bon voyage to the Lafayette, a sentinel to guard the bulwarks of freedom.
President Kennedy leaves the White House for a flight to Atlantic City to address the Auto Workers Convention. And he makes the trip aboard a brand new jet-propelled helicopter. The new craft is capable of 150 miles an hour and can carry 10 passengers, a higher speed and a greater capacity than his older one. In Atlantic City, he is roundly applauded by delegates to the United Automobile Workers Convention as he is introduced by Walter Ruther. In the wake of his tilt with the steel industry over price rises, he has this to say about the presidency. As long as the United States is the great and chief guardian of freedom, all the way in a great half circle from the Brandenburg Gate to Vietnam, as long as we fulfill our functions at a time of climax in the struggle for freedom, then I believe it is the business of the President of the United States to concern himself with the general welfare and the public interest. And if the people feel that it is not, then they should secure the services of a new President of the United States. He asked labor to hold the line, but the auto workers will seek new pay increases. After nearly a year's delay posed by its liquid hydrogen fuel, the mighty Centaur is on its pad at Cape Canaveral for a maiden flight. It is to be boosted into space by an Atlas or a 15-minute flight, a flight scheduled to study the performance of the temperamental hydrogen fuel. The Centaur is designed to put a payload of more than a ton on the moon or a thousand pounds in the vicinity of Mars or Venus. The first few seconds of the shoot go without incident. Centaur climbs to 30,000 feet, then malfunction. The immediate cause of the explosion is not known, but if it happened in the Atlas booster, it means a probable delay for the next U.S. orbital flight by astronaut Malcolm Carpenter. Long lens cameras capture pieces of the wrecked missile falling into the sea, falling like a wounded bird. However, in the race for space, scientists find progress in every failure. Britain's biggest sports event, the Football Cup Final, packs Wembley Stadium at London with a roaring crowd of 100,000. The match gets the seal of royalty with the arrival of Queen Elizabeth. It's Tottenham Hotspur, last year's winner, versus Burnley. And Tottenham in the white shirts kicks off. The game is only three minutes old when Jimmy Greaves gets the ball, loses control momentarily, regains it, and boots a goal for the Spurs. Still 1-0 in the second half. Slow motion shows you Jimmy Robson shot through the goalie's legs, tying the score for Burnley. Cheers hardly die down when the Spurs attack again. John White crosses the ball to Smith, and Tottenham regains the lead. A penalty goal by Captain Danny Blanchflower clinches it. Tottenham wins 3-1. British Cup winners for the second year in succession. The eighth annual Lake Wampatuck Regatta at Hanson, Massachusetts. Outboard hydroplanes zoom away in the final. Then come rooster tailing around the end of the oval course with a spray of flying. The drivers bend to their water bugs like jockeys in the Kentucky Derby, intent only on getting home first. Smooth sailing on the straightaways, but they run into jams on the turns. One of the boats flips, and another rams into it. The motors are 40 horsepower and they travel over 60 miles an hour. Seems like a lot more in the water, especially when they crack up. A ducking for the victims, but nobody hurt, and the race whizzes on. James Howe, Hawthorne, New Jersey, brings home the trophy.
a family outing in Lewis Bay, Hyannisport for the Kennedys. The president, accompanied by his convalescing father, his brothers, and a full complement of children, relaxes from the cares of Washington with a day on the water. Mrs. Kennedy swims with astronaut John Glenn, a weekend guest, before they team up to put on an aqua show of their own. The president stays on the sidelines as Mrs. Kennedy and high-flying Glenn practically go into orbit aboard water skis. Mrs. Ethel Kennedy, wife of the Attorney General, is at the controls of the towboat and she turns on the steam. The astronaut and the First Lady put on a dazzling show, the Hyannisport Watercade of 1962. Aronimink Golf Club near Philadelphia sees the PGA Jinx work against Arnold Palmer, fresh from his British Open win. He has never won the PGA, and today rivals like Bob Golby run far ahead. Golby is hot on the fourth and final round, and the crowd sees him duel down to the final hole with Gary Player, the South African whiz kid. In this 44th professional golfer's scramble, the crowd is treated to a brand of super golf, along with some heartbreakers. When George Bayer misses a two-footer on the 18th, he has to settle with a tie for third place. There's high drama on the 18th green as Player eases a 35-footer to within two feet of the cup. That gives him a short one for a par four and the match, unless Bob Goldby could have come up with a birdie from 25 feet out. He's close, but he stays one stroke behind. Then the $13,000 putt that makes player the first non-resident to win this title. He appears overwhelmed as he lifts the ball from the cup. Gary Player, with his card of 278, takes the title by one stroke. A storybook finish. The greatest field and track spectacle in the U.S. since the 1932 Olympics as Russian and American track aces clash. In the women's 100 meters, it's long-legged Wilma Rudolph Ward who streaks away from the field to prove once more she is the fastest woman in the world. Two from each nation compete in every event, and it's a Russian who runs second. This is the fourth time the Soviets have met with the U.S. And in the men's 100-meter dash, Bob Hayes equals the meet record set in 1958. When Mr. Hayes gets going, the X-15 couldn't catch him. Ralph Boston runs up a record all his own as he beats the Russians for the fourth time with a leap of 26-9. As the U.S. rolls up a handy point lead, Hal Connolly contributes his bit as he sets a world mark in the hammer throw with 231 feet 10 inches. A mighty heave is that. The second day of the two-day meet sees attendance go over 150,000 and a program of thrills begins with the women's hurdles. The Russians prove too good for the U.S. duo as they run 1-2. Irina Press and Ilya Kuklova spark a Russian victory in the women's field events. But for the first time in four years, their margin of victory is narrow. Feature event of the day is the 1,500-meter run, the metric mile, and all eyes are on little Jim Beatty, co-captain of the American team. He's leading in the last lap with victory closer at every step. When need be, the mighty might has a reserve. He seems to turn on at will. Beatty is across to set a new American record as well as a new meet mark. Climax of the meet comes in the high jump. With everyone else out, Russia's Valerie Brummel goes over 7-1, 7-3, and finally 7 feet 5 inches for a new world's record. The high-flying Russian takes a new record home, but the U.S. takes the meet on points. <laughs> 